Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for Detroit Free Press. And of course, we're always blessed to be joined by our producer, Wes Davenport, who you guys see on the screen if you're watching live or later on YouTube. Again, if you're on YouTube, hit that like button. That helps share the episode and get us out to more people. Hit the subscribe button if you're on Apple, Spotify, whatever. Same thing. Leave us a five-star rating review. All of those things to continue to help the Pistons Pulse grow. Obviously, we were scheduled to record on Tuesday night. Omari can explain what happened there real quick. And we are coming to you first thing Wednesday morning. I'm sure my wife is hating me right now. It is 630 where I'm at. I'm always up this early. Get a workout in all of that. She gets up a little bit later and then she gets the kids ready for school, all of that stuff. But I'm cutting about 15 minutes out of her sleep time because She's right across the hall from me, Omari. So like right now, even though the doors are closed, I'm sure she's just annoyed as heck with me yeah. that, that she can't get some more sleep in. So uh, how was your night, man? Like you're texting Wes and I, I'm on a flight. I'm not on a flight. I'm getting a different <laughs> flight. At one point, we talked about recording with you in the airport, but it, it sounds like you made it to Atlanta. I did make it to Atlanta uh, last night. You know, it's funny. I guess they saved all the, the travel issues for the, the end of the season because that was the first time I dealt with that many delays. But it was just one of those things where you board the plane, uh, planes having issues. We sit on the tarmac for an hour. We deboard. They're like, you know, we could, this could be a while. Like, there's no clarity. Uh, they pushed the board time to 6.30. We are supposed to leave at 4.30, so we're two hours past. And there's just all this uncertainty. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just switched to this 9, 10 p.m. flight. And we were going to record the pod. We were supposed to do 8 p.m. last night. So, you know, we we're just going to move it up at 7 and just knock it and out. Do it then. there in the airport. And I'm in line uh, trying to figure my situation out, you know, still because my luggage is on the original flight, even though I pushed it back a few hours. And then all of a sudden, you hear the announcement on the intercom. Yeah, we're boarding flight 1467 or whatever it was. <laughs> So now I have to get back on my original flight because I tried to scan my original uh, boarding pass and they were like, well, you switched flights. So you have to go back to customer service to get back on the original flight. And oh, I'm like, man. And I'm like, but my luggage is already on there. And on top of that, my seat is still on the original flight because nobody could have taken my seat because the flight got delayed. So all the people who are on standby, I've already gone home. And they still made me go back and have to adjust it. It was just this back and forth thing for like two hours trying to figure out what I was doing. But long story short, it just got to the point where I was like, you know what? Let's just record in the morning because I don't know when I'm going to get to the hotel. <laughs> so let's just let's just push it back and make it easier for everybody. So this is our earliest recording in a while. I'm, I feel like we had gotten to a pretty good flow of doing evening recordings. And with a couple weeks left for the season, ideally this would be the last time we have to record this early for a little bit. So I guess yeah. we'll see. I don't, I don't mind the mornings and you know, maybe yeah. like Will J popped in, always appreciate Will. He, he pops in just to say what's up and then that he'll listen later. So we appreciate you. Maybe some people who aren't able to watch, watch in the evenings live, maybe they're getting a chance here in the mornings. I know, you know, people are commuting to work and getting started with their day and, and all of that. Maybe people already have, but maybe we get a few people in here that don't always get to watch live. So this is an all mailbag episode. We got a bunch of questions already from Twitter. We'll get to as many as we can. If you're watching live, put it in the comments. Wes will be following the chat. He'll start. He already has one starred here that we'll, you know, we'll put in as we go throughout the episode. So we'll just, let's get to it, guys. We do have a little bit of a heart out because I do have to become a teacher here fairly soon. And I can't be late for that, especially live on YouTube. That would not look good. So uh, yeah. we have a little bit of a heart out. We'll get to as many as we can. If there's some we really like, Amari, we'll star them and we'll bring them back next week or something. You know, uh, content's going to be a little interesting coming up with the end of the season. So without further ado, Wes of the Detroit Bad Boys podcast, the pin down, which you guys should be watching watching on YouTube Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, kind of depends on the evening, but him and Blake Silverman always doing live stuff over there. So make sure you're watching that, but he's going to come in. He's going to play host and lead us through this episode. Yeah. All right. So here's our first one, guys. Uh, do either of you get a sense that Cade Cunningham could force his way out of Detroit if things go poorly again next season? This is from Fueled by Motown on Twitter. 
Amari, you probably have a little better perspective on this. I mean, I have my thoughts, but I'll let you start if if you've heard any rumblings or whispers. No doubt. Uh, I would just add off and say that the precedent for guys forcing their ways off of teams like this early into their careers, especially first round picks, is just extremely slim. I mean, you look at the last however many first round picks, uh, you know, of course, things didn't really work out between A and and the Phoenix Suns, but a lot of that was just them not necessarily wanting to extend him, uh, give him the max ex- extension immediately, and that's where that relationship kind of soured. Uh, you know, I don't expect the Pistons will have maybe that brutal of a negotiation with Cade, because I think Cade's probably been a bit better than <laughs> Aiden has through the stage in their career. But beyond that, I mean, you look at Anthony Edwards, he's still in Minnesota. I know that they're good now, but they weren't for a bit. Zion is still in New Orleans. Uh, obviously, Markel Fultz, Ben Simmons, those guys got hurt, so it's not quite the same scenario. But Ben Simmons still lasted in Philly for a long time before they they traded him, right? Currently, Towns still in Minnesota. Uh, the precedent for first-round picks, first on their way out after year four, is just not really there, um, You know, especially once he gets his money. It's just what leverage do you have at that point to really force your way out? Uh, you haven't been an all-star. Uh, you know, you don't really have the accolades that guys who forced their ways out typically have, which, you know, of course, part of that's because the Pistons haven't been good. So, you know, maybe there's some sense of, well, if you're on a 16, 17 win team, then, you know, that's what's going to block you from those accolades. Hey, we're getting Bryce's cancel on this morning. Let's go. This is a this is a special time. We're gonna have to do more mornings of if, if Bryce's kids are gonna come on. We need that we need that energy late in the season. But he said story, he, he said hello, but I had it muted and I was like, but brother, <laughs> I can't hear you, just wave and like he's just hanging out right now, just chilling, waiting for breakfast. So sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Just chilling. No, it's all good. But long story short, it's just the precedent of guys doing that that early into their career is just not really there. So I understand the fear just from the standpoint of they won 17 games last year. They're probably going to win fewer than that this year. Like that worry, but historically like that precedent is just not really there. Uh, typically guys need a lot more personal accomplishment before they get to the point to where they could start swinging their weight around a bit. And I would still think the Pistons are a few years away from having any real issues as far as that now behind the scenes could i see k in this camp like maybe putting more pressure on the organization to make win now moves i mean i could absolutely see that right uh the teams that were it needs to be so uh, i could see a scenario like that but for it to get to the point where he's forcing his way out you know i just i just don't think it's there yet uh historically uh, you know just based on what i've heard i don't think that's anything that people need to worry about for at least the next year yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I assume they give him yeah. the max of whatever they can this summer. Some people will not mm-hmm. agree with that. I, I'm always a little bit surprised, even just in our comments when we're recording live, Twitter, so, you know, the people that kind of are, are not fans. I don't want to say not fans of K, but just don't kind of see that upside. Um, you know, even if he doesn't end up being a number one, like usually you have two max contract guys on, on a good team. So like even if you mm-hmm. give him the max rookie extension, whatever that is, there's still going to be money there to bring in somebody better than him. If you think you need somebody that's going to be better than him. So I think they're going to give him his money. In my opinion, I- I've kind of said this quietly. I think this organization is hitched to Monty Williams and Cade Cunningham. Like those are the two guys that I think are mainstays, at least in the short term. I know a lot of people like want Monty fired this offseason. I don't think that's happening. Like I, I think this is, and I tend to feel like from an outsider's perspective, I've only been at one game all year. So like, it's not like I've been around the team at all, but that those two get along pretty well. Like they seem to be somewhat on the same page. You know, Monty lets K do his thing at the end of the games, those type of things. So I I think what you said is more likely what's to happen to Mari in terms of maybe Cade behind the scenes starts to push this organization into putting the players around him that he wants and building the roster out the way he wants and those type of things. My feeling is this thing is going to kind of go as far as Monty and Cade take it moving forward. Now, two years from now, if they're still not winning, if they haven't spaced the floor with shooters, if he doesn't have, you know, the players around him he wants, now he's got his money in his contract. That's when it could happen. I don't think it's going to happen in the meantime. We spent about five minutes on this, Wes. We better get to the next one. We're not going to get to very many of these questions. So uh, let's go ahead and get to the next one. All right, this next one, uh, I'm going to ask it to you first, Bryce. But we actually got this same question essentially twice. Uh, So this is Afra and then also Keith Black Trudeau, friend of the show, also uh, mentioned it on Twitter. But if they get the first round pick in this year's draft, should the Pistons strongly consider trading back with a team like the Thunder or the Blazers? And then Keith asked essentially the same thing. 
Yeah. So real quick, shout out to Afra. He, uh, over on the Motor City Hoops Substack, he put out an article like, this isn't why I started the Substack. Like I just started it because I was making these game notes and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to put these out for people to look at if they want, you know, whatever it's yeah. grown a little bit, not a lot, but he emailed me and was like, Hey, I would like to write some articles. You know, we had these conversations and he put an article out. So it was why the Pistons should consider trading back. So you can check that out on the Motor City Hoops Substack. But listen, I think this is a really decent idea. Wes, you and I have talked about this. One of these teams have to want to do this, though. Like, that's the thing is, who is the player these guys pinpoint they want to go get? Now, if I can trade back and get, let's say, Dalton Connect and, you know, maybe two wings, Omari, or if you guys think you want to add a big, right? Like, maybe, I don't know where these picks exactly land, but if it's mid-first round or whatever, like, if you get Connect and Klingon or Edie and those guys come in and you're backup five men or something like that, I'm for that. Like, I just don't think there's this can't miss prospect in this class where I would rather take two bites at the apple. I know that's two young players you're bringing in, but connect is 22, 20. There's some older players higher in this draft, Amari. So I would definitely consider this. Um, Although I will say I've been one that said, how many young guys can you bring in and find spots for? So that would be the caveat is like, if you bring in two young guys, Amari, now, how many vets are you going to be able to put into the roster? Because you have two more guys you have to prioritize. So that that's the twist on this in terms of that. Yeah, uh, the thing is, I don't think the Pistons are looking at this offseason like we need to get younger. <laughs> you know, kind of like how Bryce said towards the end, uh, they definitely want to make a push and improve pretty substantially next season. You have all this cap space and this and that. You have all these avenues to improve. So. In my mind, if they're trading the, the the pick, you know, I would think they're probably trading out of it entirely rather than trying to get, uh, you know, two bites at the apple in a, a draft that nobody really seems that thrilled about. Uh, with that said, you may have a team that, you know, like Sar is their guy, like they're going to try to get Sar at all costs or Risa Shea or somebody else, and maybe in that scenario, trade makes more sense, but. You know, I don't know if the Pistons do that trade for like two first round picks. Maybe you get one first round pick and then a guy who can actually help you win games now. Uh, you know, I just I just don't necessarily sure. see them wanting to add, you know, two more guys between the age of 19 and 22, you know, after a season like this, where it's just pretty clear you needed more like win now firepower, right? Uh, that was one of the big issues this season. So um in this draft, I just don't know. That's really who those two guys are to where you're like, well, we have the second overall pick, but we're going to settle for seven and 11, um, you know, in a draft where there's probably only four or five guys that you really, really like. So, I mean, again, like all this comes down to where, you know, teams fall in the lottery. Um, you know, it's kind of hard for me to do hypotheticals just because we don't know where these picks are going to fall. The has got the first pick. They could fall down to five again. And, you know, even in the draft like this, there's a, a pretty big difference between one and five, but to me, I would think that they would want to get a guy who can help them win now rather than just add two more rookies. Uh, I don't I don't think the parties to get younger this offseason. I mean, I think the play then is can you trade back and get a future first round pick or future asset? Or like you said, you know, like I think about I guess the Grizzlies was a team I saw. <laughs> Good morning, Cheryl. Always appreciate when you can join us. Um, connect in Matos. Like that's it. That's two wings. One of those, a 22, 23 year old who at the very least can probably come in and immediately space the floor. And then Matos is going to take a little bit more time. And, you know, so I was thinking. I was thinking about the Grizzlies because that conversation happened the other day. You know, they have a bunch of wings right now. Like, how is that room going to shake out? The Thunder, like, the guy I would love to shake away from the Thunder is Isaiah Joe. I I don't Mm -hmm. think you're going to do that because he's so good. But, like, they're not in a cap situation where I think it would matter for them. But, like, they're going to get there, right? Like, you're going to have to pay – Jalen Williams, you're gonna have to pay Chet Holmgren eventually, like all these guys, like maybe before they have to pay Isaiah Joe big bucks, maybe you could shake him away. Um, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think that's right. Amari, like somebody like that makes more sense than just two of these. It, it's kind of, it's always fun to talk about bringing in two more, but then again, you got to find minutes for them on a team that already has a bunch of young guys. So, um, Great question from Afra. And I think trading this because of the draft is going to be a conversation that comes up a lot as we get closer, just because of, you know, the, the names at the top and people not being crazy excited, Wes. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so for this next one, we actually kind of got a twofer. Uh, one was submitted beforehand. This is from Mike, uh, Matt, sorry, Matt Haggerty. Uh, and as well, Aruna mentioned very much the same thing here in the live chat. 
Um, so, Omari, if the Pistons want to make a big trade this offseason, who are some players that might become available uh, later on here as you know teams make their playoff runs? It's going to be players, and we talked about this on the pod, but uh, just with the new uh, cap rules, it's going to be teams that are looking to save money and not be deeply, deeply, deeply in the luxury tax for a team that's not not winning. I know one player that is sort of right in that cross section of on a good team, really expensive. Can they afford to keep him? Is Carl Anthony Towns? Yeah. Um, it's you know, but the Pistons actually go as far as to make a swing for that type of guy, especially when they don't have a first round pick they can trade before I think it's 2028 20, now. Um, you know, I don't know if they just have the package that Minnesota would even be interested in. Like, I look at Detroit's roster, and, uh, you know, if their decision is we're going to build around Anthony Edwards and Rudy Gobert, who on Detroit's roster helps them get closer if you're trading Carl Anthony Towns. And I look at it, and it's like, I don't really know. <laughs> um, you know, cause just given that this team obviously has struggled, and you probably only have a handful of, of guys on this current roster who could go to a contender and help immediately. And that's who are those guys on this team, right? Kate, Fontecchio, um, you know, maybe a guy like Grimes, if he could get healthy and start knocking down threes again, but there just aren't a lot of proven role players on this team who are slated to come back next season and they have all this money they have to spend. So maybe if Minnesota's just cool, just, hey, we're going to, you know, just get off this money and we don't necessarily need to maximize the return. Uh, the Pistons, of course, could absorb that salary with all the cap they have, and that makes more sense. But, you know, again, I think their lack of a first-round pick, a recent first-round pick that they can trade, will limit them in a lot of discussions. But some of that, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how it shakes out in the playoffs. Uh, like, you'll have a team, like, you know, if the, if the Clippers lose in the first round, like, what do they do, right? If, um, you know, Boston comes up short, like, let's say they fall in, in round two after the season that they've had, like, what do they do, right? You have all these teams with all this salary who – would be forced to make, you know, some pretty big decisions. So that's what I'm looking at. But again, I think a lot of that just comes down to who actually loses, right? I think it's tough to say um, who that player would be before we actually get into the playoffs. But I think Carl Anthony Towns is probably the most notable example of a guy who kind of fits that mode. Well, and the thing you have to remember with the Wolves is, and I listen, like this isn't my own thoughts or research, but listen to a pod the other day. Like, I think they said in, in the history of the organization, they've spent like $25 million in luxury tax or whatever. And right oh, wow. now there's <laughs> they're, they're something crazy over that, you know, if they bring guys back. Yeah. And, and so like with the Wolves, it's truly like if they don't make a Western Conference Finals or an NBA Finals, they're going to have to really – make a decision here on what this looks like moving forward. And it, it really might be a money decision. And obviously we all know the ownerships thing and that fell through and whatever's going on there. Like, I know it sounds crazy to salary dump Carl Anthony towns, but they may almost have to, like they might be in a tough spot because of that, where it's just, it's simply a money decision. Like what I kind of want, I'd rather just have Nas Reed. Like I would rather just trace for, for Nas Reed and bring him in and let them keep towns and figure that out. And, you know, all of that, you know, Aruna asked about Brandon Ingram. I think that's a real interesting fit in terms of he's at the position. He is 26. That's definitely not too old, like at all. The one thing to know is he'll only have one more year on his contract. So that's one thing I want to be careful of whenever we talk about these guys. And that's the thing with Towns. Towns is about to get crazy expensive. Eventually, you're going to have to pay guys. We're moving in. Well, no, even though they suck, we're moving into that stage of things. If you want to keep Cade Cunningham, they're moving into the stage of either you go for it a little bit or you might as well restart again because Cade's getting – to that point, hopefully some of these other guys as well. But I want to make sure there's the flexibility to build out the roster around these guys, right? I don't want to trade for Brandon Ingram knowing I have to pay him $50 million a year, give Cade his rookie extension, and then we can't build out the roster any other way. You're going to lose a draft pick at some point in the next few years, hopefully. I say hopefully because then that means the team is actually winning some games. And so it's just I want to make sure there's flexibility with that stuff. A few other teams, and then we can go to break and get some of the other questions. What happens with the Cavs in the playoffs, right? I, I don't know, like, if Donovan Mitchell is a guy. Like, not all these guys are fits necessarily for the Pistons, but that's an interesting team to watch in the playoffs. The Atlanta Hawks are a team that I think eventually are going to do something. We've talked about the Chicago Bulls at length. 
what do the Brooklyn Nets do with, with the talent on their roster that they do have that doesn't seem to fit? There's some guys that could be interesting there. And the Pelicans in general, another team, the last one I'll mention is the Sacramento Kings. Like what happens if their playoffs don't go the way they want? I know I didn't mention specific players, but those are some teams in playoff situations where if it doesn't go well, could all of a sudden some things start to happen and the Pistons come in and make a move. So let's go to a break. When we come back, Amari, we'll get right back to Wes and, and start maybe going through these a little quicker. I know both of us have had a lot to say on the first few. <laughs> All right, we are back with segment two, and we have a lot of questions to get through, and I don't know if we're going to get through all of them, so I will give it back to Wes, and we're going to try to speed through these a little bit quicker. Yep, so I'll go faster. Accommodate everybody. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so this next one is from Coney Snell on Twitter. It says, of the G League talent that the Pistons have had play this season, so that being Amude, Tosan, Buddy, which one of those is most likely to make the roster next season? I would say Amude just because he's the most proven of those guys. Like he kind of moved on from the two-way situation and got a standard contract. And I think just skill-wise, he's probably the best shooter and defender of the three if you're taking both into account. Uh, Tosan, I think he's actually been pretty good defensively. And Agreed. He's knocked down some some threes, but he's not the type of volume shooter that Umude is. So I would I would think Umude. Um, you know, with that, like. You know, I think the Pistons are coming to this offseason like we need to upgrade at all costs. So I don't know if any of those guys are like top of the list necessarily, but Umbude for sure is the most proven of the three. Uh, six six wing, he's exactly what they need. Um, for me, it would pretty clearly be him if you're picking one of the three. Yeah, I, I think that was my answer as well. Uh, Tosan. It, it, I always put in my notes, like, I think defensively, I really like what he does. He tries to do yeah. some stuff off the bounce. It's not always fruitful. He made some shots uh, in the last game, I believe it was. I think he made two threes, maybe. It's just such low volume. I mean, if you go look at the yeah. percentage right now, you will be like, what are you guys talking about? I think he's over 40% from three, but it's like one a game. And so, like, if you told me he was really going to improve the jumper, then I would be a little more interested. What you said there, though, is... I mean, I, I get caught up in this, right? Like we we get caught up in these guys. I think Keith Black Trudeau brought it up, like all the different names of, you know, Eugene Amarui and uh, who, who the little point, Carson Edwards and all of these different yeah. guys that we kind of get excited about. And it's like, at the end of the day, most of them probably aren't going to stick. And we probably shouldn't want them to stick because you want this talent to increase and be better 11 through 15. Like you almost want these three guys back on two ways, right? Like you feel pretty good if, Amude and Tosan are your two-way guys and Buddy who has gotten better, can space the floor, and you're only using them in break glass situations. I will say it does make me feel like I wish we could win on the margins one time. I wish, you know, Troy could find one diamond in the rough, whether it's a second round pick, a drafted free agent, you pick someone up off a two way, like one guy, not to be a starter, guys, but just to come in and actually contribute. I still don't know that we've seen that guy, but yeah, I would say a mood a if you had to, if I had to pick one. So Wes, give your, your answer on that. And then let's get to the next question. Yeah, I think it's a mood. but I was kind of curious about this next question because Jonathan strong on Twitter was inspired by that Keith black Trudeau <laughs> yeah. uh, tweet that you just mentioned. So he wanted to ask uh, which of those late season guys that Troy Reaver has brought in, which was the worst, which was the best going back over, you know, the past four years. Amari, so uh, Keith Black Trudeau, I don't know if you saw it, he put out like Tyler Cook, Carson Edwards, Eugene Amarui, and then uh, Metu this season, which Metu just came off a, a really nice game. Like, I don't know that, I, I don't think that any of them are the worst. Like, I don't know what the bad yeah. situation is, but I, I don't know that any of them are the best either. Like, to me, they've all been essentially ended up as indifferent. Now, you may be able to throw names at me that says like, we should have brought in this guy. Look what he ended up doing for this team. Like, that's where it, isn't indifferent right is there may have been an option out there to bring in somebody else on a two-way or a end of the season contract keep them around and they did become rotation guys so none of them have hit i guess the question then would be is what are the names of the guys they missed out on that they could have kept around a little bit long term to help out this team yeah, that's kind of where I was. It's kind of tough to say which one is the most pointless because, like, at this point in the season, they are just all here to just fill spots because you lost guys to injury. Um, you know, so in the majority of situations, most of those guys are just not necessarily going to be guys who stick beyond that 10-day or in the season or whatever it is. Like, you know, I, I know folks remember Tyler Cook a couple of years ago. Like, he came in a uh, little bit of an undersized big, but he came in good energy, good athleticism, but 
then the season ends and you look at it long term, like how do these guys fit? A lot of times they don't. They just came in to, um, you know, show what they can do, uh, audition a bit and fill in a, a, a gap for a team that had a lot of injuries and just needed some bodies. So, um, you know, like I, it's, it's tough because like from like a fan and from like a media standpoint, it's like, you know, all like all this stuff has meaning, right? Like you want to talk about this stuff as though, you know, it matters in the grand scheme. Now, I want to say it doesn't matter, but just in the vast majority of cases, a lot of these, you know, signings you make at the end of the year don't really amount to much. And that's just the nature of signing a guy in April or late March. Like, you know, they're guys who are still trying to prove that they can make a difference in the league. So um, best or worst, I, it's it's kind of tough. Like, I don't think there's a, a, a worst. I think they're sort of all in the same tier. And the best would be a guy who actually proved that he could come back. And we haven't really seen that either. So to me, they're just all in that same tier of, just late season signing. Um, but I agree with Bryce from the standpoint of they just need a guy who is a diamond in the rough who actually comes back and it's like we have to prioritize this guy at all costs. Like they haven't had that yet. And that's kind of what they've been looking for. So YouTube user brought this up in the comment section. He's mentioning sure. that the Pistons have been using the two-way spots on like low ceiling but high floor guys. And I kind of wanted to spin that into a question for you both. Like what would your approach be with those two-way spots? Would you want just the high ceiling, but you know maybe it's a lottery ticket, or would you want maybe more of a a sure thing uh, with those roster spots? Yeah, I, I know. I just said that like Amude, Tosan, those guys back on two ways next year. Like I, I'm going to contradict myself because I kind of was thinking it as I was saying that because I do think those guys have earned some spot around the league. But I kind of agree with YouTube user here. I, I think if I really thought about it, I'd rather bring back like one of those guys. And then have those other, like, I would recycle those other two spots every year. You know, I would find the most upside, you know, you, you have to consider personalities, Amari, and you don't want to just be bringing in just anybody into the building or whatever. But yeah, like just guys that could actually click and have high enough upside to really do something, you know, and I, I'm with YouTube user there. I would use two of those on those type of players, like just you know, I'm not saying starter level players, but really there is a ceiling there. Even if it's only 5% ceiling and the 95% is they're not NBA players at all, like eventually one of those guys click. So I would have one like high floor, low ceiling, and then I would use the other two spots for those higher ceiling guys that may actually end up in a rotation. Yeah, uh, this is another one I'm struggling with a bit just because a lot of times when you get to guys who are undrafted, Sure. None of them are necessarily high upside guys. If they were, they probably would have been drafted and not yeah. in a two-way situation. I just think the reality is that once you get to that tier of player, a lot of it is just a, a, a crap shoot. Um, yep. You know, if they're a, a too high upside guy, like let's say like a Gigi Jackson from Memphis, right? It would be yeah. great to sign a guy who's young and has upside, right? But those guys tend to be draft picks. They're not guys that you're signing at the end of the year because teams see that p potential. So more than often it's guys who – or on their second or third stop and just hadn't last on anywhere else. And you're just seeing if there's anything else there, which, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, you know, the guy just kind of is where they are. Right. If it doesn't work out at the first couple stops and now you're 24, 25 in most instances, um, that's just kind of where you are in your career. And you don't usually see those guys uh, blow up later on. Um, you know, so you could argue they they could go one way or another. I know a lot of people were upset about them signing buddy last season, but buddy came back this year and he's been, one of the better guys on the cruise and he's shot the ball really, really well. Right. You know, I think people would have caught him low upside probably last season, but he came back this year and he's improved his game and he's been probably one of the, one of the better two way players they've had to be honest. So the reality is that you just really don't know the guys come in, they may have a certain perception or reputation, but generally if it's truly a high upside guy, like they're going to be on a roster somewhere already. So, um, in well, you my have to mind, draft them. Like so, Gigi yeah, went 45. Them, yeah. So like, you would right. have had to make a, you know, a move to go get that pick, right? Like you would have had to trade something yeah. to go get it and just say like, we're going to target Gigi Jackson and we're going to bring him on, put him on a two way. And obviously so far that's worked out good for Memphis. Yeah. And YouTube user mentions that, but is a terrible defender. And it's like, yeah, typically a guy is going to have some sort of flaw that prevents them from truly being uh, a daily rotation player. You know, with Tosan, it was just this lack of a, a jumper coming in, right? Like, it's always going to be something. So I just think when it comes to this tier of players, it's just the reality is that it's just a, a crapshoot, right? You know, if it's a guy that truly has high upside, then you're probably going to draft them. And, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. Well, I mean, we just talked about it with Amude and Tosan. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can make an argument that Tosan fits into this. Like, he's a good defender, has an NBA mm -hmm. body. Can he develop a jumper? 
If he doesn't, he's never going to be an NBA player. If he does, all of a sudden you could say, hey, there was a higher ceiling for him there. If he's able, like every one of these guys are going to have to develop something and you're just banking on, can they develop that? Now, maybe we disagree on what you want to bet on, right? Like with Buddy, you know he can space the floor. Like he's probably an NBA level floor spacer. Are you going to bet on Buddy Beheim actually getting more athletic and stronger and all of those things to become a competent enough defender? I don't know. So that's really, it's like, what are you betting on? What what does your organi organization feel like they can develop? So, all right, Wes, what do we got next? All right, this one is from Brian. Uh, Bryce, go to you first. Is Jaden Ivey on the same timeline as Kate Cunningham? And if not, can he catch up? Uh <laughs> Listen, you guys know how I feel about Jaden Ivey. Um, listen, I also like it, go read my game notes. Like I criticize Jaden Ivey just as much as anybody else. Like I want to be, you know, clear with that. I thought the last couple of games, his first half process has been good, and his second half process has been bad. He had some really bad defensive possessions on whatever, you know, on Monday night. Listen, I I still believe in this. For me, I think Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey can work because I actually think Jaden Ivey can play off the ball. It, it Yes, he has to be able to catch and shoot better than what he's done so far, but I think he can attack closeouts. Watch some of his best plays. It's cutting off Cade drives. It's coming off pin downs and weak side staggers and getting out in transition. I think they can work together. I know most people don't. That's fine. I don't think that Monty believes in the – he may believe in Jay Ivey. I don't think Jay Ivey is the prototypical off-ball guard that Monty Williams wants. I'm not even sure Cade Cunningham sees Jaden Ivey as the ideal backcourt running mate for him. So for that reason, I don't think this ends up being the backcourt that moves for the next few years. And I was thinking about this this morning, Amari. They moved on from Sadiq Bey, not the year, but the year before he was going to become that restricted free agent on his rookie deal. That's coming up for Jaden Ivey and Jalen Duran. So I'm not saying this offseason – but if, if they do feel the way I think they feel about Jaden Ivey, I think it could happen as soon as the upcoming deadline because that's whenever they went ahead and moved on from Sadiq Bey, whenever they didn't want to pay him what they thought he was going to ask. And real quick, shout out Sadiq Bey. I hope he's recovering well. Like just awful timing for his knee injury. So just quick shout out there. But those are my thoughts on Cade and Ivey, Omari. Yeah, no, obviously awful timing for Sadiq to deal with the torn ACL. So of course, hope he makes the full recovery. Uh, no, I don't think Ivy's in the same timeline as K. And I don't know if he's ever been. He, he's always been more of a, a guy like, you know, if he hits his higher outcome, then he's a guy who could fit with K. But I, mean, I know we talked about this a lot leading up to that draft. And, you know, we've had debates throughout the season. Yeah. Is that it's just certain it's just certain skills Ivy has to develop that he has not done with consistency that are going to have to come from to really be uh the fit next to k that the team needs and that's going to be defense and that's going to be uh, outside shooting and he shot the ball pretty well to start he's been in a pretty bad shooting slump since all-star weekend uh he's had good stretches of defense you know i think the defense has kind of slipped uh in the last month or so um so i guess as far as saying timeline like those guys are only like you know like a draft of, of, of parts so on that standpoint they are but i mean k was the number one pick he came in uh, you do. You were pretty certain he's going to be, at the very least, a pretty good starter for you in this past season, uh, or I guess this current season. You know the efficiency has been there, and he's been a lot better. So that's more of a number one pick timeline. Ivy was always more of a project, I think, to start. And uh, on his really good bites, it's like, yeah, this is absolutely a guy you would have been around next to K. But he's going to have to really knock down shots. He's going to have to really lock in on defense. And uh, there's other stuff he adds, so that's good. Of course, his downhill pressure is you know really useful. But, you know, just to fit next to Kate, I just think there's a very narrow set of skills you have to at least be proficient at. And that's going to be his swing skill going forward is, I think, defense and outside shooting. Yep. All right, Wes, what do we got next? Well, let's stick with uh, the Jaden Ivey conversation for a minute. We got this question from Derek <laughs> Brown on Twitter. It says, would you trade Jaden Ivey and Marcus Sasser for Alex Caruso and Zach Levine in Chicago? So I don't know about that trade specifically, but you know, maybe talk just about Jaden Ivey and, and Zach Levine because that brings up something from earlier on this season. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm avoiding the Zach Levine. Like, I, I don't know what his injuries are, right? Like, I, 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 this was a question back at the deadline when this was the hot – and then now he's been injured again. So people said it back then. People are going to say it now. There's a contract. Like, here's what I will say. I think the archetype of Zach Levine 
makes a lot of sense next to Cade Cunningham. That's what I will say. I think that's the idea of what you're looking for, ideally for an off-ball running mate with Cade Cunningham based off what we've seen from Cade. And then Alex Caruso is Alex Caruso. Like at the end of the day, this would be, I mean, and then Alex Caruso is really good. And again, fits exactly what this team would need in terms of spaces the floor a little bit, one of the best perimeter defenses and defenders in the NBA, like all of that. So value otherwise, Alex, you get somebody like that and then the archetype of Zach Levine, sure, that's what you're looking for. There's part of me that doesn't would be interested to see Jaden Ivey getting traded because I would love to see what his value in the NBA is. Like, I have no idea what Jaden Ivey's value would be around the league. Like, could he bring in something that, that was a good haul? But I, I just don't – I think it's so hard to discuss Zach Levine right now, Amari, because we have no idea what the medicals would say. And if a team – is he a neutral asset? Is he a negative asset because of that in the contract? Like, we have no idea. And how do the Bulls view him? Like, are they willing to, you know, get rid of him as a negative asset? So it's such a hard conversation around Levine. Yeah, I mean, I will say that Caruso and Levine would be the two best players in that deal. So to me, Chicago's willingness to do it would be just the extent that they don't think they can salvage the Levine situation because of injuries or because of salary or this and that. Uh, but to me, if – for that in that deal they would probably be settling just because they're giving up you know a bona fide proven score and one of the best uh all-around guards in the league in caruso uh you know for two guys who have not played on that level uh, you know so with the pistons do that trade like i i think they probably would <laughs> to be honest even with the risk with the v because they need to speed things up uh you know i don't know if chicago does that trade if i'm chicago well I'm gonna, i don't think ivy and sasser else. I don't think Ivy and Sasser make a ton of sense with like, if they're getting yeah. rid of Caruso and Levine, they're building around at least Kobe White, And then yeah. like do Kobe and Jay Ivy and Marcus Sasser all make sense. You know, uh, Io DeSumo is quietly, I guess probably like has been, had been really good here late in the year. So like, how do you prioritize all of that backcourt and all of those guys? I would think they would be, you know, wanting some more yet yeah, to me. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this is almost Levine as a negative asset, which I know some people consider Levine to be a negative asset. Like, I get it. So, yeah. um, but yeah, would you agree that Levine is the archetype that makes the most sense off of K? Like, don't do you, I feel like truth, like bucket getter, high volume three point shooter. I feel like Cade would love having that guy next to him. What I'm not saying it has to be no, Levine. 100%. I'm just saying that, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, he's athletic. He could shoot, get to the rim. Like he's a really good all around scorer. Uh, you know, the boss still in Cade's hands. So I think Levine can play off of Cade really, really well. So, yeah, the archetype of that player, I think, makes perfect sense. So you had another guy in Caruso who can really, really defend. Uh, like, that's exactly what you need in the backcourt. Like, if I'm viewing – if I had to pick a shorter player to pair with Cade, it would be a guy exactly like Alex, Alex Caruso sure. who could take yeah, a yeah. tougher defensive assignment, can move the ball. Like, that's, that's perfect. So, yeah, kind of like I said earlier, I think for Detroit, that's – you know, a pretty cleanly won trade, even with the injury risk for Levine, just because it checks so many boxes for them. Even if Levine that doesn't work out, guess what? You got Caruso, so you still got a really good player out of that deal. You know, if you're in Chicago, I don't know if they necessarily get the same thing. They got to bank on some development happening. So uh, I think Chicago would need a bit more for that trade to really make sense for me, Trey, so. All right, let's get to one more. We'll go to break, and then we'll just go rapid fire after the break. But let's get to mm. one more here before that. All right, quick draft one here. Then this is from Nairobi on Twitter. It says, "How do you feel about Kyle Filipowski?" I mean, I like Kyle Filipowski's game. Okay, I like Bryce Well, yeah, I mean, I like his game. You know, I think just you look at a guy like a uh, like Gallinari or like Mike Muscala, with those guys ready sure. to come in. And you have a guy in Filipowski who can really like he he can pass it, solid rebounder, like shooting like thirty five percent from three, like all around pretty good scorer. Uh, that's like to me he is not necessarily maybe with this team needs from a starting big if that makes sense just because they probably need a guy who's a bit more defensively capable but Agreed. beyond that like you look at Mike Muscala's like plus minus numbers in Detroit and it's like <laughs> man like a floor spacing five like absolutely pops in Monty's offense and really kind of brought things to life and it probably wasn't going to stay the plus minus wasn't going to be that extreme probably over the course of a whole season but it just shows how much 
value a player like that can add. So, you know, I, I like I like Kyle Filipowski. I think he fits Detroit, you know, just because their biggest priority in the front court is probably a guy who can defend. I don't know if he's a priority there, but uh, offensively, I think he's a perfect fit. Yeah, I like him off the bench. Um, right now, I have Filipowski kind of late lottery in that mm-hmm. range. Like he, he, I don't think he's going to move up by my board at all. He could move down my board a little bit. If anything, I'm still, you know, how good is the defense? How much can he move? And how skilled is he? Because I, I think he's skilled. Like the idea of Filipowski is a, a seven footer with decent movement. You know, he'll be neutral defensively, but is really skilled. 35% from three on three attempts. Even the free throw percentage for his career, 72%. He he can pass the ball. But again, it's not like the actual production doesn't quite meet the eye test. Like I've watched a lot of games where I've just gone, man, I'm just going to buy this because it looks really good. So if you kind of buy the skill set, he's really intriguing. It, this would only happen in a trade back scenario that we talked about earlier. Though. Like you, To me, Filipowski should not be in the discussion of where the Pistons could land in the draft. It would only be if they traded back or, you know, whatever, to get two picks or traded back to get a player and a later lottery pick or mid first round pick. But yeah, he would be like an off the bench. I I don't know that Filipowski is your starting five man because of the defensive, like he's just not going to be an anchor of the defense type of, of big man at the five position. So let's go to a short break, Amari. When we come back, we'll send it right back to Wes and we'll just, I'll shorten my answers and, and we'll try to get through as many as we can here. All right, we're back with segment three. We've got about 18-ish minutes left, and we're just going to go rapid fire. So go ahead and lead us off, Wes. Well, this one might not be a fantastic (laughs) one for rapid fire, but it was a great question, so I wanted to bring it up from Data Driven Pistons fan. Uh, Just saying in general, have you noticed if the Pistons are running different sets and actions based on which two guard they have on the floor? So those two guards being, you know, Ivy, Fournier, to a lesser extent, uh, Mude before he got hurt, um, those types of players. No, I, I haven't. I feel like they run a lot of the same stuff. The one thing I will say, I like some of the ATO stuff that Monty Williams, after timeout, start a game stuff, Monty Williams runs. I, I had my notes in, in my very last game that he ran a real interesting action. So I, that's one thing. I know Monty has taken a lot of heat. I like some of the set actions he run. I'm interested to see as this roster turns over next season, Omari, if we see more of that 0.5 offense and it seems like Cade pounds the ball a lot. Sasser gets in, pounds the ball a lot. You know, like I'm interested if we get a little more into the point five stuff next year. Um, but no, I, I guess to answer his his or her question specifically, um, I don't notice a difference with who's on the floor and kind of what they're doing. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Like I thought it was really glaring when uh, you know Quentin Grimes came in and he's like probably dribbling a lot more than you would expect, right? And they talk about point five on a season. They just are not really stuck to that with any consistency. And on paper, Grimes is like the perfect guy for that because he's just, yeah. you know, catch and shoot, you know, or cut, or like he's a good cutter or, you know, driver or whatever. And, you know, when you see him taking three, four dribbles, it's like, like, I don't really know what's going on here. That's not <laughs> how I thought they would use Quentin Grimes. So, no, I haven't really noticed that. And I think that's a, a, an area of growth over the offseason for the coaching staff is to just maybe dial into guys' strengths and weaknesses a bit more. And if you have a guy like Grimes, then, you know, obviously – you probably want to stick him in the corner, right? Like how they were sticking Ivy in the corner. Like you want to, you know, so there's probably more optimization you could do as far as that. Yeah. The only player I want to see pounding the ball for that many dribbles is Cade Cunningham. Everybody else should be yeah. one, two dribbles and you're either downhill shooting or passing the ball. And that includes Jaden Ivy for me. And honestly, that includes Marcus yeah. Sasser as well. So um, that's where I'm at with kind of the offense. All right, this next one here, this is from Ku, and it kind of builds off what he was talking about when he joined our show just a couple yeah, weeks ago. You guys ago. go so listen you guys to that if you to haven't. That. Yeah. Great stuff from Ku. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so this is his question. This is from Twitter. He says that the Pistons prioritize Cade Cunningham and Asar Thompson. Does it make sense for them to try and grab a stretch five as the starting five instead of a guy like Jalen Durant? I mean, I would say yes. Um, I don't think it's a have to, though. Like, let's just work in the world where Asar doesn't become a floor spacer, right? Like, I I think that's fair to assume that that's a possibility. If you have Cade and then two other guys that can really stretch the floor at the two and the three or the two and the four, depending on where you plug Asar into, I think you can get by with Asar and a non-shooting big as long as that non-shooting big is really good defensively. So I think you can get away with that because of Asar's passing, what he's able to do, hopefully rim pressure wise, as he tightens his handle, all of those things. 
ideally though, and like, this is just what I believe in general, Amari, I'm sold on the stretch big rim protector. Like if you give me that guy, I think it just changes the whole dynamic of your team offensively and defensively, unless it's Jokic, right? Like if he can be the hub of your offense, which the Pistons aren't going to do because Cade is the hub of the offense. So you don't even need to go after If there's a Jokic type of player, there's no, there's no Jokic, but you know what I mean? Like you don't need Alperin Shingun, I guess is my point. You need a Chet Holmgren archetype of player, you know, Victor's a Holden level, you know, beyond that. But you know what I mean? That's what I would look for stretch five. But if that stretch five doesn't protect the rim, then you better be elite, elite at two, three, and four defensively. So it, not just a SAR, but then those other two guys better be elite on the perimeter, Amari. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I think every team kind of wants those guys who can, <laughs> like, hit shots and defend from the five. But you look at the number of guys who actually do that around the league, like, just non-superstar guys, right? Like, you have Jaron Jackson Jr., Chet Holmgren, uh, Miles Turner, but it's just not Brooke a Lopez. lot of those guys. Brooke Lopez, um, but there's not really a lot no. of those guys. So I think especially if you have a star in the starting lineup, you're giving up something on offense or defense if he's like your quote-unquote four in that lineup because, you know, if it's a big deck of shoot. More often than not, they're probably not going to give you a lot of defense, right? So you're going to have to really beef up your perimeter defense and you know, have guys who can just stop the penetration to be, begin with make the big job easier. Or if it's a big that's defensively good, you have two nine shooters up there. When now off the cade, you need at least you probably need two elite shooters at the two and the three at that point. So uh it's kind of just like a pick your poison to me, I guess. Like if you can get that like Jackson or Holmgren type guy, then that solves pretty much all your issues and you can just play a star wherever you want at that point. And that's like the ideal scenario. Uh the reality is that those guys are really hard to find. They're hard to trade for teams. We're just not going to give those guys up. So if you're not drafting a guy like that, um, yeah, you're probably going to have to pick one or the other. And I think that's tough. But in that scenario, maybe I would still lean toward distress five just so that your sure. offense can really pop. And, you know, you have a star on the floor. If K can make a lead defensively and you get another good defender in there like Fontecchio, you might be able to survive. So that's kind of where I lean. I would lean toward the stress five, but ideally one way or another, you're just getting a big that can do both. And then you don't have to make those tough decisions. Yeah. I like the idea of a stretch five. Cause I think that it not only does it open up Cade, I think if you're pr in this scenario, you're prioritizing a SAR remember, right? Like, so that kind of assume mm -hmm. that means you've either traded Ivy, moved him to the bench, same with Dern, whatever. I think to pri maximize a SAR, you want to give him floor spacing as well. Like a SAR at his best is going to be, in an open space floor. So offensively, it's best for Cade. It's best for Asar. And then I think what you just have to say is, Asar, you're the anchor of our defense. Now, what's the high-end upside of a, a wing slash forward being the, the best defender on your team? I don't know. Like, I don't know the history of that. But if your five-man can stretch the floor and be neutral defensively, and then you put a couple other good floor spacers and good perimeter defenders with that, I can live with like, it's like, okay, let's put Kyle Filipowski at the five, right? Like three years from now, stretches the floor, neutral defender. You put two other good defenders there. They can space the floor, let Caden Sar go to work. Like I can see that. I will say real quick, Wes, and then we'll get to the next one. This is why I love Alex Sar so much is mm -hmm. he has the potential to space the floor. And I know people, some people don't believe in it at all. Some people don't believe it in like the very near future. He's shown enough flashes skill wise to believe there's a chance to go along with the defense. And that's why I have him number one on my overall board is that archetype is just so valuable. So, all right, next one. Well, this is a somewhat related question. This is from Igor Santos on Twitter. Uh, he asks, has the question, can Cade, Ivy, Asar, and Dern play together actually been answered this season? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, not I this version so. of those. Okay, yeah, you think it's been answered. So what's the answer though? I think the answer is like they fit awkwardly. Um, yeah. You agreed. know, and some of those guys would just have to, you know, just improve their games for it to really work. Yep. But I think with Asar and Duran, uh, you have two non shooters. And on top of that, Duran's not quite the defender you need him to be. So you're just always going to be giving something up. Like those guys can out rebound, probably most front courts for sure, but you're giving a lot up. And we just talked about Ivy, so we don't need to go through that. But at this stage in their development, like, I don't know if those guys together uh, 
like jail in the way that you would want a four man unit to uh, jail, you know. So I think that's probably a big uh, point of the off season is just figuring out uh, like which of these guys are the perfect fit, and then from there, if you don't necessarily think a guy will develop this skill or the other, like who do you get in free agency that could fill those gaps? Yeah, I agree. I think the answer right now is no. Under the yeah. under their current abilities and skills, no. And in fairness, you can project Jaden Ivey probably as a 33% three-point shooter and a SAR, like who knows? And Duran, a lot of the skills I was hoping he would have and develop haven't shown up. He's still young. All of these guys are young. And so that's why you can't say like, no, it can never happen. Real quickly, I don't think you always have to play them together. Like we throw yeah. around the core four, like they have to be starters. And, and Laz probably brings up a good point. Like let's stop calling them the core four. They don't need to be the core four. If you tell me like Ivy ends up being a six man off the bench, I don't know the history of the number five overall pick doing that for the team that drafted him. Maybe that's not realistic, but I don't think they have to play together to provide value to the organization. So I want to throw that in there as well. I do want to get quicker here, so I'll leave it there and we can go to the next one. Okay, so this next one is also talking about development. I thought it was a pretty good question. So this is from Keanu yeah. Paris on, on Twitter. But just ask, you know, in, in general, when you guys are talking about player development, when do you say that a guy just, quote, is who he is or maybe still even has another evolution to go on his game? Uh, Bryce, you first. Yeah, this is hard. This is a great question. I don't think we can honestly answer this unless we're around the players. Like, at the end of the day, we sit here, and I was thinking about this this morning, guys. Like, I'm not here to, like, tell anybody that – I don't know any more about basketball than anybody else. I'm just here because somebody gave me a platform and a microphone to talk basketball. And on this podcast, it happens to be the Pistons. And I enjoy doing it, whether it's 630 in the morning or 630 at night or whatever. So we don't have all the answers. Like, I think there's more development with Jaden Ivey. I don't think he is who he is, but I don't work with Jaden Ivey. I have no idea what Jaden Ivey's actual mentality is or thoughts on his role or how hard he's working on his jump shot or how he's seeing them. I've never watched film with Jaden Ivey. There's a few players I know a little bit better because of some stuff I do that I can tell you like how much more development there is or there isn't. If we're not actually in there working with them, we have no idea where that development's going to stop. We don't know how they tick and what their mindset is. The best we can do is like give them some room. I guess to answer in general, once a guy gets through his first three or four years, I feel like I have an idea at least of the trajectory or what he's going to be. Like, I feel like that, that I'm closer to like, hey, this probably, he's had four years. Now there's nuance here, Amari, injuries, team context, like all of those things. But I'd say once they get through their rookie deal, you know, four years in the league, I feel like it, but Brooke Lopez would have, you know, proved me wrong in that situation because all of a sudden he starts banging threes and becomes crazy valuable. So um, you just, you, you have to be there with him to really know Amari. Yeah, no doubt. Um, my response to that would be, I think it just depends a lot of it on the particular player, like their reputation. You know, some guys' sure. reputations is like first in the gym, first out. You know, some guys don't have that reputation. Uh, I think a lot of it is like what they need to improve in. You know, if you have a guy that's yeah. pretty much complete outside of the jumper, um, you know, then that's like one deal, right? You know, if it's a guy that uh it depends on what you need to develop i think some skills are are like either you have it or you don't to some if extent they're capped you know, athletically like, with what they can be that's different you know so it's just to me it really is case by case and it just comes down to that player's unique mix of skills their athleticism their age and kind of what you know about them as people and as workers and their reputation as far as that um, but even then, you never really know, even with that, right? Like sometimes guys come out and they show skill that you didn't expect. You know, I don't know if anybody saw Kobe White having the season he's had this <laughs> season, right? You know, so yep. sometimes people surprise you. Um, so it really is case by case. You know, I wish I had a better answer for that. But I think there's always a degree of uncertainty with any player. And I think a lot of it just comes down to who they are and their age and a lot of other intangible stuff that you can't really – track that accurately right you know sometimes guys surprise you you know in good ways and bad 
All right, Wes. Amari, let's uh, 20 seconds. We got to hold each other to 20 seconds. Hold right. We're, account <laughs> we're, right. we're accountability fire. partners here. Yes. True right. rapid, rapid fire, fire after 30 minutes of saying rapid fire. We need like a right. bell, well, this, you know, something like that. We need a bell or the, the Oscar <laughs> yeah. music when you guys yeah. are going too long, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. This next one, this next one's a good one for it. This is a good one for it because we did touch on this, I think, a couple weeks ago. But what is the percent chance that you think Troy Weaver comes back next year? This is from Big Dog Pistons on Twitter. Um, hundred percent. He runs the off season. Fifty-one percent. He's here through the regular season. Yeah, I struggle with uh, percentages because it's like, you know, like the answer is either like he'll be back or he won't, right? Like yeah. I could say, you know, I think it's forty or sixty or whatever, but at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, I would, I'll just say, I would not be surprised to see Troy. You know, man, the entire offseason, uh, he survived 28 straight. You know, I think his deadline moves generally were pretty good. And, um, you know, I think the difference now is that there's – I don't want to say like a mandate, but I will say that there is an awareness from ownership and other people involved that, like, the way we have run this team has not worked, period. You know, we've taken too many swings on guys. I haven't played. Like, we've made mistakes, right? So, you know, I could see I could see Trey Manning the offseason, but I could see it being under the lens of these certain things need to happen now, and we can't do it the same way. And that's kind of where I'm at now. Okay, so sticking with Troy Weaver, this one's kind of an interesting one. Just thinking back in hindsight uh, from Erwin Raphael, do you think that falling to the fifth pick in the 2022 draft was a bit of a derailment for Troy Weaver's vision for this roster? And obviously that would be missing out on players like Paolo Bancaro, Chet Holmgren, Javar Smith Jr., and Keegan Murray. Um, and, and I mean, derailment almost means like there was no other path to make it work. So I don't think that that's fair. Like, I think that's actually letting the front office off the hook in a sense. Yes. Chet would make more sense on this roster. Keegan Murray would make plenty of sense on this roster. I don't think Paolo would make any sense on this roster with Cade. I don't think I, I like that as much It's based off what I see, what Cade wants to be, but yeah, I mean, would this roster make more sense with those guys on it instead of Javen, I Jay Nivey? Sure. Like, so in that sense, yes. I don't think that that should be an excuse for the roster still not being as good as what it is. Yeah, um, I think that's where I'm at, too. Uh, did it hurt you to fall to five in a draft where the top four guys were pretty much, um, you know, the clear top four in the in the draft? And obviously, Jalen Williams went 12, and he was, I guess, the exception sure. to that. Um, like, I think it hurts, but I think along with that, you know, you had three first round picks in 2020, you got Cade, you know, and then you had, like you've had enough picks at this point to where I just don't think one pick falling is necessarily um, a, a valid excuse in that scenario. Like OKC had 12 and they got, you know, probably a top three or four guy in this draft. So um, and time still has to pass, right? Like right year two, you look at the draft and a lot of guys just haven't really done a whole lot yet. Um, you know, so I think it's too early to say that whether Ivy was like the perfect pick there or not, just because you look at guys that went after and, Nobody's really blown up, but no, I wouldn't say derailment. I would say you the odds are part of any rebuild. You know, like a lot of teams get screwed and they figure it out, and you just have to figure it out. Like that's just kind of how it goes. And Jaden Ivy's not an untalented basketball player, so like yeah, there's and, like, and Ivy's like, still good. Yeah, I mean, so there's that as well. So. Yeah. Well, and I was just going to throw in too, if we remember back, Jaden Ivey was actually a surprise not to have been picked number four. four. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of fans we were pretty concerned about, you know, Keegan Murray. And, and in hindsight, it looks like maybe that would have been better off. Um, but all right. So just a couple more. This is from Jared Gibbs. Does the offensive philosophy need to change? Uh, Mario, you first. What do you think? I don't think so. I think they need players who can probably execute what Bonte wants to do a bit better. Um, you know, I think if you look at the roster as a whole, um, you know, has every player been maximized? Not necessarily. Um, but I think with that, I don't think there's inherently anything broken with the offensive philosophy. I think a lot of it is just getting players who can actually space the floor and kind of complement Kate and give you more of what you need for the offense to, to function the way it needs to. Yeah, I mean, I think we have the vision. This is Monty's yeah. coaching. This is Kate's team on the floor spend the off season putting the guys around them Cade wants and Monty wants. And I realize people may not like that because I know people aren't huge fans of Monty and some people don't even believe in Cade. I think that's where the organization is. 
they are linked to Monty and Cade and those guys being successful. So Troy Weaver in the front office needs to give Monty the players he wants for his offensive system. And however that merges with the play style Cade Cunningham wants to play. I think that's the only path forward that makes sense. The margin for error there is what it is. I think that's the only way you can do it. And if you don't want to do it that way, fire the coach, trade Cade and start over. And I don't think anybody has the stomach for that. So I think this is the path they're on. All right, last question here. It's the one everyone wants to know. This is from Jance Jewel <laughs> on Twitter. Guys, are we going to get a live show before the season ends? So so real quick here, I'm pretty sure she came to the, our, our last live show. So I told Wes and Omar, I was like, we have to answer this one because she showed up. She was there. I remember she got up. She asked a question. She stayed and hung around afterwards. And, you know, we remember all the people that were there. We appreciate everybody so much. That was so much fun and, and such a stressful evening until people started mm -hmm. showing up. Um Unfortunately, we will not get one before the season ends. Like I, I didn't make it to Detroit this year. Like complete, almost complete transparency. Like I, I do some stuff away from the media side where I had to travel this year, and it just it makes it hard. Like I'm traveling to other games and stuff, and it's just I have to concede somewhere with my family. And and my concession was like not making a trip to Detroit. Like the closest thing we're gonna get in the next few months is is gonna be. Vegas, you know, and that's not really a live mm. show. That's just me and Omari together in a in a hotel um, recording. So maybe something before next season, but yeah, it doesn't look like I'll make it to Detroit before uh, at least next season. So I'm sorry, but man, I appreciate the question so much because it was a lot of fun, and we did appreciate everybody who showed up, Omari. Yeah, we will do one again someday. It is just logistically very tough to pull off just you know like bryce bryce is being pulled in like eight different directions you know of course my schedule could be uh pretty busy as well so we we we, we will figure out a, a time to do it like i would love to do one uh leading into next season or maybe early in the season but that's just tbd no promises we will figure it out uh, the, the cool thing is somebody cares enough and enjoyed it enough to ask like that yeah. that makes me feel good and that like puts a little bit of boost in like, okay, we need to make this happen. I love Detroit. Like YouTube, like I realize the season's been bad. I I've loved every trip I've gone on to Detroit has been amazing. The people are awesome. The city's awesome. Omari gets me out, you know, gets me cultured with different foods. Yeah. We've, you know, done some sightseeing. I love it. Like truly I love Detroit, but <laughs> it's been cold and rainy dude it was a blizzard in kansas like oh we had, we had a snow day last monday because it blizzard here so um but yeah man i just i just haven't been able to make it work and, and i need to so this is on me this isn't on amari it's not on west it's not on the free press it's a hundred percent on me and i hate it so wes thank you so much for navigating this for us we always appreciate when you come on you deserve it so much uh your voice needs to be heard by the listeners and the viewers so thank you listen when you guys recording wes is it tonight thursday friday when when is the pin down on next uh tonight wednesday night right okay. after the hawks game so you know if you're listening to this podcast on the podcast version just just check out the podcast feed yeah there you go um amari you made it yeah, to absolutely. Atlanta. You're there. Made it to um, Atlanta. Here. Shout out Lauren this... Williams. I always <laughs> think of the Hawks, think of Lauren. She's doing big things down there. So shout out Lauren. We should have brought her on to, to preview the Hawks game, but um, appreciate it, Koo. Thanks for tuning in. He says, good stuff, guys. Uh, all three of y'all. Thanks, Koo. We appreciate you yeah, guys. Go listen to Lockdown Pistons as well. There's enough content, like left listeners for all of us. Plenty of people doing great Pistons content. So if you're not listening to Locked On Pistons with Koo, you should be daily. Like, shout out that dude for talking about the Detroit Pistons every day, Amari. Um, you know, and then you That's writing about time. him every day. So uh, <laughs> take it away, my guy. I got to go teach kids. No, no doubt. Big thanks to Wes for leading us today. Uh, two more weeks in the season. I'm pretty much going to be in the road almost through the rest of the year. So hopefully no more travel issues like last night. And I will close this out. Uh, so big thanks, as always, to our audio producer, Robin Chan, our editor-in-chief, Nicole Avery Nichols, our executive producer, Anjanette Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. And then big shout-out again to Wes. And we'll talk to you all next week.